Please be seated. If you haven't done so yet, please use this opportunity to shut off your cell phones and put it put on vibrate. Diane Emmett. Shopek Tzedek Emmett. Baruch Diane Emmett. Shakol Mishpatov Tzedek Emmett. True judge. Judge of righteousness and truth. Blessed is the true judge, for all of God's judgments are righteous and true. We'll begin with the Psalms of David, reading the Tehillim by three of my father's grandchildren, Andy, Zahava, and Shira. We are gathered here today to, to pay tribute to my father, Moish Martin Eben Abimori Moshe Ben Yitzhak Isaac, beloved husband of 50 years of my mother Sheila, beloved father of Steve and Tara, Alan and Avi, Ira and Chevy, Daniel and Amanda, beloved grandfather to Toba, Zahava, Andy, Shlomi, Hadassah, Carrie, jo Josh, Shira, Yosef, Anat, Isaac, Olivia, Abby, and Bella. Beloved son of Irving and Celia Evan of blessed memory. Beloved brother of Naomi and Harris, who are unfortunately not able to be here today. Some of their children are here, and we welcome my cousins representing their parents. Beloved brother of Alan, who traveled from the West Coast to be here, short notice. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of many rabbanim, many of the rabbis, the community rabbis who are here. Um, it's a little overwhelming to figure out who's here, um, and I don't want to name any of them, so that uh, way I can just offend all of them. But um, I want to acknowledge all the rabbanim who are here to, pay, uh, to give honor to my father and to my family. We have a number of speakers this morning, a tribute of my father. We'll start with uh, I want to first acknowledge Rabbi, Rabbi Klein, who is here uh, and was my father's beloved rabbi, and I'm going to actually ask him to start us off. We'll follow that with um, 
granddaughter, my niece Tova, she'll be representing the, the grandchildren. My cousin Joey, my father's nephew, will be representing all the nieces and the nephews. And then we'll follow by all the children, Daniel, Ilana, Stevie, and me. Now they climb. Dear Rosh, it's hard for me to believe that on Tuesday we had such a nice conversation together. You were so, for the lack of a better word, rambunctious on the phone. Excited. And you didn't let me hang up. And here we stand today to have to say goodbye. The Gemara of Sechta's Tainus, the Achof Beis, says the following story. Rav Baroika met Elio Anavi. And he asked Elio Anavi, he was in the marketplace, who here in this marketplace is going to Elam Haba? And Elio answered him, Look, those two people. And so Rav Baraita ran over to those average-looking, <clears throat> regular guys and says, What do you do? And they said, Inchi Badichi Anan. We're people that make others happy. Comedians. If we see someone that's sad, we cheer them up. And if we see people that got into an argument, we try to make show. Moish, the Gemara. Elio Anavi is saying, you're a Ben Elam Haba. You personified what these people did. Your whole being was making people happy. Your whole being was making sure that nobody would get upset. And in your own smiley way. On more than one occasion I remember how somebody got in upset at someone else in shul and you did my job. Thank you. You probably did it better than me. Moish was a committed person to Yiddishkeit in every facet, from coming to shul, to doing all the mitzvahs correctly, how he would always say over from his father, how his father was a person who was committed to Yiddishkeit. His father was someone, he would say, my father made sure to eat Shmini Atzeris and the Sukkah Rabbi. Most people didn't. He schlepped us all down. Okay. 
And last but not least, this Shavuos Moish, I guess you're going to be setting up the speeches in Gan Eden. Every Shavuos, that was Moish's job from when he came to Shul, to make sure that there was a full night of learning, that every single hour was taken up by someone who was going to talk Divrei Taira, and he participated like a soldier every single Shuas night. Your children, Moish, every single one of them cared so much about you, they loved you, they took care of you, and you know that they always wanted your best for you. I want to personally thank Alana for keeping me up to date on every detail. And last but not least, <coughs> Mrs. Sheila Eben, who took such devoted care of her husband. A true lesson of what an Aishas Chayel really is. Should be a good to later for the entire Kehila, for all those that came, and of course for his beloved family. As the oldest grandchild, I'm sent to speak on behalf of my cousins. You hear me? I feel this is especially significant because I was named for my grandfather's mother, Tilda Zilpa. Um, together, my cousins and I pulled our top Trump stories to share today. So. One thing in particular that came up over and over again was that Grandpa was our biggest fan. Grandpa loved seeing us. Whenever we would come over to his house, he was filled with joy and he was so happy to see us and talk with us, even if we were interrupting a sports game. Spending time with Grandpa meant trips to amazing savings. He would grab a shopping cart or two and tell us to buy anything we'd like. If he saw a toy or candy he thought he would enjoy he thought we would enjoy, he would put it in the cart too. Going to the movies with Grandpa was a full day activity. We would show up at his house and he'd be sitting at the kitchen table reading movie reviews in the newspaper on every possible movie that we might watch that day. We would then raid the cabinets for snacks to bring in our pockets, complete with microwave popcorn stuck into someone's jacket. You know, Grandpa really enjoyed the movie if he only took one or two naps during it. <laughs> At the end, we would always recap when he asked, what did I miss? <laughs> As a general rule, Deb and grandchildren can't age up without hearing Grandpa singing happy birthday. I'm not really sure how that works out, but I'm pretty sure I was 18 longer than most people I know because we played phone tag for a couple days when I was in seminary. But, you know, eventually I, I aged up. Grandpa was very invested in our education. He would often ask us about school and what we were learning. He said the most important thing to like is school. It's the most important thing is to like school. He wanted us to love learning as much as he loved teaching. He was so proud of the extracurriculars his grandchildren took part in and encouraged us to take pride in our grades. If you brought him a report card with straight A's, he would hand you some money and say, my kids never got A's in school. You must have gotten this smart for me. <laughs> Whenever I took psychology courses in college, he was so excited to discuss them with me and would refer back to the psychology and education courses he taught at Turo College. Grandpa loved teaching at Turo and often told us about how much his students loved taking his class. In fact, if you look at Martin Evan on RateMyProfessor.com, he had a 4.5 out of 5 rating. 
I scrolled through the reviews to find out where the other 25 went, and apparently, one guy gave him a low rating for an anthropology class that my grandfather never taught. So, Grandpa, you have a 5 out of 5 for attempts. When Grandpa was in NYU hospital last year, I spent the day with him reading his Rate My Professor reviews to all the nurses and doctors who came in at his request, of course. His favorite review was, Gewaldig, enjoyable, interactive, you gotta try this one out. When my grandparents moved to the Five Towns last year, Grandpa discovered something even greater than Amazing Savings, Trader Joe's. <laughs> Every week, he would go up and down the aisles, even if, when it was hard for him to walk, just so he could buy all different kinds of snacks for the grandchildren. His favorite thing to buy was cereal bars. If anyone, has, if anyone of us came to visit, he would excitedly offer us a snack or a cereal bar, sorting through all the different brands and flavors until we found one that we liked. Zahava, Andy, Shlomit, Padasa, Carrie, Josh, Shira, Yosef, Anat, Isaac, Olivia, Abby, and Bella. You meant the world to Grandpa. He loved each and every one of you so much. I don't think a single day went by when Grandpa wasn't telling someone about how proud he was of all his grandchildren's accomplishments. I know that Grandpa's smiling over us and nudging the guy next to him going, look how beautiful my grandchildren are. Aren't they amazing? Thank you. My name is Joey Gilbert, and I am Sheila and Marty's nephew. I have had a very special relationship with Marty and Sheila for almost 50 years, and have never lived in a world that Marty wasn't part of. In fact, I was in my mother at their wedding. <laughs> Marty, <laughs> Marty was at my birth bar mitzvah, high school graduation, wedding, and my kid's bar and bat mitzvahs. At my bar mitzvah, he bought me my first set of tefillin and the puffy royal blue yarmulkes from the Lower East Side. At my wedding, he sang the seventh bracha under the chuppah, and then he danced the macarena. <laughs> we have a lot of history. I've nearly collapsed List, I've nearly collapsed lifting him on chairs at his son's and grandchildren's <laughs> barn by Memphis. Packed and moved his house, done his taxes, built his sukkahs, visited him in a variety of homes, hospitals, and rehab centers, brought him all kinds of snacks and cold beverages and ice, lived in the apartment that he grew up in on the Lower East Side, and more recently had the bracha of putting on to fill in with him in what turned out to be his last days here. My most special bonds with Marty were forged while at the Shabbos and Pesach table. <coughs> the Eben Shabbos table was where I first heard such famous tunes as Birkat HaMazon, Eishas Chayali, even Shalom Aleichem. It's where Shabbos was fun and keeping Shabbos was normal. There was always great food good company, and lots of laughing. <coughs> For over 40 years, many of the Gilberts and Evans have spent their days at Seders together. At those Seders, the family bonds, traditions, songs, and jokes have been formed and solidified. Marty was always the leader in the heart of the Seder. I think that the Seders were probably his favorite night of the year. And that will be one of his lasting legacies for all of us. He, along with Sheila, began a tradition which has been continued by Alana and Avi to host a large, inclusive, long <laughs> Seder <laughs> where family, friends, and friends of friends are welcome and are well fed. Even this past Pesach, while he was in the hospital, the Seder was very much about him, and I really heard him in my head with each page turn. My family did not grow up Orthodox. In fact, the only modern Orthodox Jews that we knew growing up were the Evans. When it came to religion, they did not judge us. 
or shame us. They included and accepted us. And they loved us. They showed by example the beautiful parts of living a Jewish life and having a Jewish home. I've often thought that had Marty not continued on the orthodox path that his parents had set for him, how many things would be different for generations of people named Gilbert, Evan, and Ferdick? To clarify this point, my Uncle Marty was the only Orthodox Jewish adult that I really knew when I was a kid. It's not a stretch to say that his faith in Hashem and his love of Judaism is the single reason why his children and his grandchildren, and for that matter, my children, are Torah-educated Jews today. I'm thankful for the relationship that Marty and I had. He was my uncle and my friend. I'll call him my funkle. <laughs> to use a phrase that I generally hate to use, our relationship really was all good. I didn't have that kid father baggage that comes along with it. I could appreciate his cuteness because I wasn't married to him. <laughs> we could talk about sports because I wasn't betting with or against him. I could visit him and he was always happy to see me. I could do something to help him physically, like push his wheelchair or make him more comfortable in a bed. And he appreciated it and he always said, thanks a lot. And I was happy for the opportunity to bring him comfort and I got a mitzvah at the same time. <laughs> Lastly, we both like to sing, we both love Sheila, and we both know that Alana is really an angel and probably the best person in the world. <laughs> to my Aunt Sheila and cousins, <coughs> Stevie, Alana, Ira, and Daniel, to their spouses and their children, Please know that all the Gilberts are crying with you. We love Marty, and we love you all. May Hashem bless him and Shemayim, and give comfort to all. from him over the years, but the things that I learned from him weren't by means of him teaching me them. I don't remember him ever saying to me, come here, I'm going to teach you something. Rather, I learned them from watching him. He never sat me down and told me to treat everyone and anyone with respect, or to welcome them and to make everyone feel welcome and comfortable in their homes. He just did it, and I was lucky enough to, to pick up on it. Whether it was the range of eccentric relatives, or friends, or friends of our relatives, or the flavor of the wheat that I would bring home to be Makar or, or to convert. Or the Russian guy from his shul that he adopted and would come over almost every Shabbos meal for years. But we all thought it was a spy. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone seemed to feel comfortable and welcome in our house. He had a calming and non-judgmental non way about him when he spoke to people. Usually involving a joke or something funny. He was always giving charity. I'm not sure if he did it on purpose, but lately, over the past few months, I've been getting phone calls on my cell phone from organizations saying, Mr. Evan, this is Torah, Sashem, Shlomo, Sutter. <laughs> Can we count on you to repeat your contribution from last year of $36? To which I respond, I don't know what you're talking about, which Mr. Evan are you referring to? <laughs> and they say, Martin Evan. And I say, this isn't his phone number. <laughs> Many years ago, I was working for an accounting firm, and I was walking the street back from a client with my supervisor, who was a Chinese woman named Maggie Zhu. And a, a man standing in the street on Broadway said, can you spare some change? And instinctively, I put my hand in my pocket, and I pulled out a dollar, and I gave it to the guy. And Maggie said, wow, you're really nice. And I asked her what she meant, and she said, you gave that bum money, that's really nice. I thought for a second, I said to her that when I was a kid, I was at a Jewish wedding, 
And I was sitting next to my dad at the ceremony. There was a bunch of people walking around, sticking their hands out. And I watched my dad and kept taking some change out of his pocket and handing it to him. I asked him, where, where are these who are these people and why are you giving them money and they're not giving you anything back? And he said, they're poor people asking for charity. And if someone sticks their hand out, you have to give them something, even if it's just a quarter. And I said to her, I guess I didn't realize that that's being nice. It's just what you're supposed to do. And Maggie said back to me, it sounds like you have a good father. About a year and a half ago, my dad was being taken into for emergency surgery to repair his heart. And they were telling us that it was very risky. And as they were taking him in, he grabbed my hand and he said, he, wished, he said, wish me luck and I'll see you later. And I was thinking, I guess he wasn't listening to the doctor say I wish <laughs> Anyways, a few hours later, one of the surgeons came out and said to us that the surgery wasn't going well. We're not sure if he'll make it out of the operating room. All of a sudden, I got overcome with a wave of emotion, and I lost it right there in the waiting room. I started bailing and crying in front of Steve and Tara and my mom, Lana, and a room full of strangers. I was thinking about how my dad was, was going to die, and a man who was pregnant, and he's not going to be able to meet my unborn child. And I was angry at him. I said, why did he say I'll see you later? Was that the best we could come up with? Well, as, as we all know, he survived the surgery and recovered. And about six weeks ago, I was sitting next to him on the couch, on the couch in my house. We were celebrating Bella's one-year birthday party. And he was smiling and crawling at her. And he was watching her dance and eating her first lollipop. And I looked at him and I said, and there were tears in my eyes, and I said, Dad, I, I'll see you later. And I left because he was right. So I'm pretty sure you know what I was talking about. <laughs> but then he did it again. He had a rough past month. He was sedated and, and, and kind of out of it. We had a lot of time to think over what was going on. And then all of a sudden he started recovering. And this past Sunday, the last time I saw him, me and Amanda and my three kids were visiting him. And he was smiling and enjoying them. And I said to his dad, Last week, I thought we'd never be speaking to each other. And he said, yeah, they keep telling me that something like that. <laughs> just shrugging it off. But we got to enjoy our last time together. And I was able to bring my family, the men and the kids, to visit him. Even though he didn't say it very often to me, I could tell that, that, that he was proud of me and proud of, proud of my family. And that I was proud of being his son. father wouldn't have loved to see all of you here. We always like a great big party. That's really the same. For those of you who know me well, know, you know that I tend to be a person with a very positive, pretty positive outlook on life. What you may not know is that that positive outlook comes from my father. My father, Moshe Eben, Moshe Ben Yitzhak Isaac. Two days before Pesach, my father was rushed to the hospital with a serious infection and wound up on a respirator under heavy sedation. He slept for three weeks through the entire Pesach and then some. You can imagine the outlook of his doctors was not positive. And then my father did what few men could. He woke up. He regained his personality almost immediately, including his remarkable optimism. Just days ago at rehab, he called his friend to discuss his plans for a kiddish this week. In addition to his positive outlook on life, my father was very funny, a natural teacher, and honestly believed he was as handsome as the vaguely familiar looking man in his wedding pictures. <laughs> so naturally, he took credit for my sense of humor, my good looks, and my humility. Of course, we know we have my mother to thank for my looks, but my father took credit for it anyway. A few months ago, I decided to give my father some nachos by showing him something nice that someone had written about me. He read it over and over again. He even told his friends about it over the phone. 
And of course, he took credit for that too. But really, what was so clear was he was so proud of me, and Avi, and Steve, and Tara, Ira, and Chavi, Daniel, and Amanda, and even more proud of all of his grandchildren. My friends and family have, have all heard the story of the time Alana's daddy left her on the train. <laughs> I must have been about fifth or sixth grade, and my father took me on one of his many class trips. I fell asleep on the train, and when I woke up, my father in his class was gone. <laughs> I quickly got up at the next stop, I got up at the next stop, and I did what I learned from my mother and Sesame Street. If you are lost, go to a policeman. <laughs> When I found the policeman, I told him my father left me on the train. <laughs> His first question was, does he do this often? <laughs> Turned out I was only one stop away from my father's school. The policeman went to a pay phone, called my father at school, and then escorted me on the train back to one stop where my father was waiting. When he saw me, I remember that he looked relieved. And then he asked me what he could bribe me with so I wouldn't tell my mother. <laughs> I love to tell the story because it was very funny, especially when my father insisted that he never lost any children on his class trips. But the real reason I'm telling this story now is because of the part I never shared, that I've clearly seen in my head again and again. I saw my father, and I ran up the stairs. And I re when I reached the top, he gave me the biggest hug I could ever remember. And I never forgot how safe and how loved it made me feel. In the early 80s, my father wrote and directed a play called The Immigrants. <laughs> Apparently back then, it was totally acceptable to perform a school play that managed to mock literally every racial stereotype <laughs> one can find on the Lower East Side. <laughs> one of the parents actually videotaped it, gave him the videotape, and a few years ago we found it and converted it to DVD. Dad was so proud of this movie. He insisted that everybody watch it over and over again. It became a family punchline. I'll admit that it was pretty funny, and he always would point out his brilliant writing and the skills of the student actors. But when he described it, you could hear how proud he was about how he inspired and encouraged his sixth grade students, most of them barely first generation Americans, to perform, to be leaders, and to shine. In the many, many years that my father taught in public school and later at Torah College, he continued to inspire students to shine. One of the nights in the hospital, I remember the PA showed me one of my father's chest x-rays, and she pointed out that my father had an abnormally big heart. Big, like the size of a large candle. She was trying to explain why this wasn't such a good thing. <coughs> Knowing my father, I didn't see it like that. It was no secret that my father had a tremendous heart. He loved people. He loved his family. He loved his friends. He loved his rabbi. And he loved all his nephews and nieces. <coughs> he, loves his he loved his parents and set an example of how to do keep it of an aim that is legendary in our family. He really loved a good kiddush. Big parties, leading the Pesach Seder in his very original way, watching sports on TV, and even more, Mommy, he loved you. Mommy, on behalf of Daddy, we thank you for everything that you have done for Daddy, and we know that you have done everything. Uncle Alan, my father's brother, while we may have lived far from you, we know that you're always there for us. You erased all those miles between us this past month with your love, support, wisdom, and guidance. You are truly connected to our hearts. About two years ago, after one of my father's miraculous medical recoveries, it was almost funny to have one of the top heart surgeons at NYU come to the visiting room and admit that he had no idea how he saved my father's life. It was then that my brothers and I decided that it was time for my parents to give up their palatial Brooklyn estate <laughs> for a ranch house near me on Long Island. My father had no interest in leaving his community, his friends, and his shul. And I apologize to all of you for taking him away from me. 
Um, and down to that last Shabbos, he asked me to explain why I was making him move. Daddy, I explained for the millionth time, you will live near me. I will visit you all the time and we'll have many Shabbos meals together. Your children and your grandchildren will visit and even sleep over. And mommy will have the garden that she always dreamed of. He liked to say he did it for mommy. My father and family were Zohar to live this dream for the past year. Many Shabbos meals together, many parties, lots of laughing, and great nachas for my father. When I was little, I went on a trip to Niagara Falls. I remember that as we were walking towards the falls, my father excitedly told me that we were actually going to stand right on top of the falls. He sounded so excited, but I was really scared. I asked, will you hold my hand? He said, of course I will. He did, and I remember feeling safe and loved. You always hear about people at the end of their lives who say, if only I had one more week, what I would do. Medically, the doctors prepared us that it was unlikely my father would be leaving the hospital. Somehow, Hashem granted us this gift, and that, along with my father's incredible sense of optimism, willed himself to live one more week. He woke up from his medically induced coma and then spent the next week at rehab. While there, he was surrounded by his family, his children, and his grandchildren. He washed Nebavasar. He put on tefillin and davened every day. He spoke on the phone to what seemed like everyone he ever met. He had the opportunity to sing happy birthday to his wife of 50 years. And my father, the guy who could never pass up a good nap, was awake for all of it. Holding court, telling jokes, smiling, and clearly loving every minute, except for the fact that he couldn't eat chum. <laughs> he held my hand a lot while I sat with him, and what he gave me once again to forever hold was the feeling of being loved and feeling safe. I know, Daddy, that wherever I go, whatever I do, you will always be proud of all of us, taking credit for all the good we do, and always, always holding my hand. She's always a tough act to follow. My father would have loved this. He would have liked it to be catered, but he would have loved this. <laughs> you may be sensing a theme with the speeches, but we didn't coordinate beforehand. Moish Evan? I love that guy. That's the response I always got when I introduced myself as Steve Evan. Didn't matter if it was RJJ, the Lower East Side, Marine Park, or even Woodmere. Everyone he met loved him. Whether it was his students, his friends, his card buddies, the guys behind the counter at his favorite used food store, or any of the other shuls that he was a part of over the years. Those who knew him cared for him. And with good reason, he connected with people and treasured relationships. As we were making plans for the funeral, I was struck by how many people, other than the family, who have loved my father for multiple decades. But there were also the people that he just met, having moved to Woodmere just over a year ago, and here too he made connections. Truth is, he was easy to like. He never saw the bad in people. My father always felt that people were inherently good, and that, and as his son, I can tell you, I personally gave him reason to think otherwise. I'm sure I'll, all of us did it one, all, all the si siblings did it one time or the other. But he never did. He loved us unconditionally and saw the good in us. And looking around the room, whether you knew him personally over the years or just through his children, you knew he cared for you. And it was certainly no secret that he loved his grandchildren. When, he would, when I would call to share a story about my kids, 
he would eat it up. He would say, I never had an honor student. I never had a kid who got an award. <laughs> True. <laughs> but we knew he was proud of us and, he, and the lives that we had built. This was his legacy. He had a stereotypical Jewish family everyone wishes for. A lawyer, an accountant, a teacher like him, and a rabbi. When he started teaching at the Board of Ed, making about $8,000 a year, and putting four kids through yeshiva, about $20 at a time, he certainly struggled. But he gave us everything that he could, and the hardships didn't seem so bad. Our friends may have gone on vacations while we went on road trips in a car that inadvertently broke down on the side of the road. But it didn't matter. We were together. I heard a definition once that always struck me, struck with me. Stip siblings are children of the same parents, each of whom are perfectly normal until they get together. <laughs> but being together is what we loved. Did we all share the only room in the house with an air conditioner that hot summer? Sure, but we were together. And, we, and, we, and that bond is one that I will forever be grateful for, and one that I hope I can cultivate in my children. Looking at my father, people may not realize that he was a true fighter. He loved life and wanted to live every minute that he could. He did want to live forever. And some of us were almost convinced that he would. When he had his quadruple bypass over 10 years ago, he wasn't expected to survive too long, and yet he did. And when he had his aortic aneurysm, the doctors told us there was no way he would survive the surgery, and yet he did. He lived to see the, his youngest grandchild, Bella, be born, and loved every minute with her. He lived to celebrate his 50th anniversary with my mom just this past March. He was so excited to make a party. He wanted to invite everyone he met to celebrate. And when he was in the hospital with pneumonia recently, doctors were ready to write him off yet again. And we said, you don't know my dad. You really don't know who you're dealing with. When he amazed the medical professionals by making it out of the ICU, at first he couldn't speak because of the trait. The first thing he was able to communicate to me was, little ones. He wanted to see his grandchildren. I never knew how my dad was that good at charades. And of course, there might have been other things that he may have been trying to communicate to me. But we're going to go for this. He loved to laugh. He had a unique sense of humor, laughed with him or at him, I don't think he cared. Sometimes a straight man, sometimes off color, but even if it was just a facial expression, he liked to laugh. My dad also loved to teach. He was, a proud, he was proud of the number of students that passed through his classrooms, especially the ones he directed in that little show he wrote called The Immigrants. He was proud of his score on Rate Your Professor, and when you get home, please Google it. <laughs> you will realize that the, when th this is the rating of a man who loved to teach, even when not every, every presentation hit his mark. He loved to make speeches, even though his family would cringe every time he approached the microphone. He inten his intentions were to express his love and appreciation and entertain at the same time, even if sometimes it didn't come out the right way. But it didn't seem to matter to him. What was important was saying thank you. As I have read the notices from all the organizations that we are collectively a part of, and I read the tributes on Facebook, I realized the ironic thing about my father is that he would have loved to see those things. He would have wanted them printed out, and then he would have them put into a folder. We were always looking for folders to put things in for his printouts. He wanted to look at them and study them, not because they mentioned him, but because they mentioned his children and his grandchildren. That is what gave him joy. He really didn't want much out of life, just the simpler things. Family, singing happy birthday at the top of his lungs as off-key, before presenting you with a birthday check, taking his grandchildren to amazing savings to buy whatever they wanted for $5 or less, making sure everyone got the aliyah of our mitzvah parsha, we always got those calls, and of course being thankful for what he had, making a kiddush with a good piece of kishka and his beloved shalant. In fact, he was trying to plan the Chaz Hashem kiddush the Shabbos, 
Didn't matter that he was far from out of the woods and had a tube in his throat to breathe, he was thankful. When he lived in Brooklyn, my dad used to call me to come over for silly things. So return my video, I think most people remember what that means. <laughs> Find my shoes, plug in the answering machine, etc. But I think he really just wanted an excuse to see me, or at least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> the truth is, Dad, I would love to hook up your VCR so you could watch The Immigrants one more time. On behalf of the family, I want to again thank everyone for coming and filling this room for my father, who would absolutely love that everybody was here for him. And I do want to particularly acknowledge Rabbi Taib, who was here, who my father loved dearly, and Rabbi Kamenetsky, who visited my father on several occasions and gave him physic and support, as well as, of course, all the other rabbinim who were present. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. Over the last few weeks, Alan and I found ourselves as the de designated healthcare proxies together for my father. And we had numerous difficult and agonizing decisions to make. Now it states in the healthcare proxy document that the proxies are responsible to follow whatever decision we would presume that our father would want and choose for himself. <clears throat> Throughout the ups and downs and the roller coasters, and there were so many, we kept asking our, each other the question, how would dad approach this? What would dad be thinking? What would dad want for us to do for him now? So I now have to ask myself, what kind of eulogy would my father want? First, the answer is, I think everybody did a pretty good job. So I could just sit down. But believe it or not, if it were up to me, I think I would just stand here and cry. I would talk about how much I miss our often ridiculous pre Shabbos conversations. I would miss hugging him and miss hearing him tell me how proud he is of me. I would describe how right now I feel like a piece of flesh has been ripped off me. So much force and so much pain. It hurts so much and the pain is so deep and I can't possibly fathom ever the pain going away. But, that's not what my father would want me to talk about. First of all, my father would have nothing written down and pretty much nothing prepared. And that's not how he would ever give a speech. My father would want me to open with a joke, tell a quick Devar Torah, but not too long because he might fall asleep. He'd be self-deprecating, tell everyone how cute he was, and the clothes was a joke or something mushy. So here it goes then. Mom, you were right, this, is, this isn't easy. The good news is, is you saved a few bucks for not hiring a rabbi today. <laughs> plus, plus, I played the rabbi card, and the funeral home gave us a deal. <laughs> Daddy would be very proud. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. In the 55th chapter of the book of Yeshayahu, the Navi describes the contrast between God's world and man's world. You see, there are different ways to view the world. There's God's way from the heavens, and there's man's way from the earth. And then... Then there was my father's way, which I think some functioned somewhere in between those two places. I would often believe that my father lived in his own universe, 
where the rules for everyone else didn't apply. My father had his own sense of reality. Deep down, I think he even thought he was skinny. <laughs> now, it could be from the Lower East Side, where they believed that out of town meant across the Williamsburg Bridge. It could be because he was baby Meishi, as he was the Ben Zakunin. He was the youngest by far of the children. To him, life was, life was good. As long as you had some basic, basic things in this world, a family, you had religion, you had friends, and a good kiddush with chant and kishka, and orange crushed soda with ice, all the world was good. As I said before, he never believed how sick he was. He really had no, had no idea. We were always amazed how he kept coming back over and over again. Nothing made any medical sense, as it was mentioned. And it worked really all the time. I honestly believe that if he thought about how many medical issues he had, he would never sleep at night. I know I had trouble sleeping at night. But in this little, his little Pollyannic world, everything was going to work out and be fine. That's how his world functioned. We would always be on shvilkas for things. Daddy, we're going to be late. Daddy, mommy's going to get upset. Daddy, you shouldn't eat that. Daddy, there's going to be traffic. Daddy, you forgot a line on the train. <laughs> While this could be frustrating at times, it often worked very much to our advantage. I remember when I was about 21 or so, and Daniel was like 17, and being a typical teenager like we all were, my dad was complaining to me about how disrespectful Daniel was to him. And I said to my father, but dad, we were all disrespectful at that age. And he said, you? No, you weren't. <laughs> I said, of course I was. I think even worse. He said, really? I said, well, that's great news. Because this means you don't remember any of it. <laughs> Which is great because it means you won't remember any of this either. <laughs> because the world is good. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways are not your ways. As we've said before, over and over again, it really can't be mentioned enough. My father loved to be around people, and people loved to be around him. He loved telling jokes, he loved making people laugh, he loved holding court, and I think that's why he loved being a teacher. We talked about that he loved influencing people. That's really not true. He wanted an audience every time, and there he had it. And if he didn't laugh, he didn't get an A. <laughs> My father also never got frustrated around people. Chavi just described him recently as a diffuser. No matter what interesting or difficult personalities were around our table, and there were many, he was always patient and welcoming. There really were very few people who had a negative word to say about my father, perhaps outside his wife and his children. My father had a simple emuna pshuta, a simple, basic faith. A few weeks ago I spoke and shul about the different ways our rabbis viewed our relationship between man and God. That while on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we see God as our Avinu Malkinu, our father and our king, on Pesach, the relationship is described differently. It's described like a husband and a wife. And I talked about how when I put my tefillin on my father these last few weeks, and we said the words, Arashtik li le'olam, I am betrothed to me forever, you are betrothed to me forever, everything seemed to fit. Dad's world was fine again. Somehow, despite all the machines and the beeping, like a spouse or a lover who has been with you for 50 years, there's a certain comfort of being together. Whatever was going on, throughout my life, my dad would ask, did you have a mincha? I said, Dad, I have a shul. I have to do this. <laughs> In the middle of the game with the score on the line, he would stop the daven always at the very last minute before Shkia, or maybe a few minutes after Shkia. My dad had his own schedule, one that no one in this world actually functioned in. <laughs> but he always woke up for his man Kriyachma. He would always wash his hands. In his world, the ritual of the mitzvot always was a mainstay, a lesson that I watched and I kept. 
Most people say goodbye. Not my dad. My father was mentioned was sedated for several weeks during the last, this last battle. We actually came up with this brilliant idea that this Sunday will be Pesach Sheni, and my father, who was in an induced coma, slept through Pesach, and we were going to have a Seder for him on the Sunday without the matzah and the wine. It was a difficult and not looking good, and we were discussing palliative care. And of course, as I mentioned, he pulled through again at the end. After weeks of being asleep, he came out of it. And we all got to say hello to him again. We got to hug him, put on his tefillin, we got to daven, he got to see all the grandchildren. He was particularly loved when I showed him Shlomit online, and I showed him Shlomit jumping out of an airplane. <laughs> Hi, Shlomit. Sadly, things turned yesterday morning, and what is really unbelievable is that he left us without our chance to say goodbye. It's funny, Dad didn't like to say goodbyes. He didn't like sad goodbyes. He would always say, they know for this before. He would say, bye, see you later. So in Dad's world, we didn't get to say goodbye. But we did get to say hello. Mom, for 50 years, you took care of him. In health and in sickness. 50 years ago, you ironed his one pair of pants every day. <laughs> so he can go to work. 50 years you did this, and you never, ever complained. <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> you existed the most in Dad's world and universe, which I know, personally, was often frustrating and required a ton of patience. And Mommy, on behalf of all of our siblings and the whole family, I want to thank you. Daniel's charm, Alana's positive outlook, Stevie's wit, my love for ritual, and all of us have his sense of humor. I also look like him the most. <laughs> Daddy, we all got a piece of your world inside us. And in the end, from a broader world, perhaps I didn't always appreciate it at the time, it really was pretty nice to be a part of my dad's world. Bye, Daddy. I'll see you later. The hey nishmato tzuror v'tzuror t'chayim. May his soul be bound in the bond of eternal life. Please rise to the Kalmari. Mali Rafamim, Shahochei Bamromim, Amasim Nukhanakona, Al Kanfe Hashina, Malot Kedoshim, Potorim Kedorakiyaz Mazirim, Ed Nishmat, Abimori Moshe, Ben Yitzhak Isaac, Shalak Lialamo. Ma'avur sh'anachem k'malun v'hasbarat nishmato v'gan e'idem t'hem aduchato t'chein b'alarachem y'asir v'sidim k'nafal t'yolamim v'tzor v'tzorachayim et nishmato Adonai u'nachlato v'nach b'shalom al mishkavo v'nomar amen Dear God Long compassion as well as on high. Grant proper repose and the shelving wings of your presence to the lofty levels of the holy and the pure. Shine on the brightness of the firmament and to the soul of Moshe ben Yitzhak Isaac, who has gone to his world and for whose memory we pray. May his repose be in paradise. May the master of compassion bring him under the cover of God's wings and bind his soul in the bond of life. May the Lord be his heritage and may he repose on his resting place in peace. And let us respond. Amen. Amen.
In turn, we'll follow in Beth David's cemetery in Elmont, and we gotta get there soon. So we're going to uh, apologize, but we're gonna try to leave and get to our cars as quickly as possible before the 12 o'clock lunch break. The shiva will be held at Four Hazel Place in Woodmere until Wednesday morning. Shafrat will be at 8 a.m. every morning, and Mincha at 7.55 p.m., followed by Marav. On Sunday, Shafrat will be at 9 a.m. So the pole bearers are going to ask for all the grandchildren to please come forward to escort the casket until outside those doors. We'll follow that the, by the pole bearers to come to see them outside the doors. Yitz Elman, Avi Furtick, Mickey Gilbert, Rafi Gilbert, Joey Gilbert, and Ari Gilbert. She sees me the most. 